In this session today, we're going to take a detailed look at Quercos, which is a tool for qualitative analysis of text data. We're going to go through all the major features step by step, and we're going to show you how to use it from scratch, including downloading and installing it, and getting to the stage where you're comfortable doing coding and producing outputs to represent your data. So the first thing that we're going to do is show you how to download the software. Uh, you can go straight to our website, which is www.quercos.com, and you can download a full free trial. Just click on the Get Quercos button and then download. And it doesn't matter whether you're working on uh, Windows, Mac or Linux, you'll be able to download the software for yourself and download a f the full version of Quercos. So the trial is not restricted in any way. It just lasts for a maximum of 28 days. And after that, you just need to buy a license and you can keep working on your projects. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that our licenses are very inexpensive. So if you do like Quercos, um, our licenses are permanent and don't expire. So I'm going to show you step by step what you'll get after you've installed the software. It's identical on all the platforms, so it doesn't matter what system you are using, whether it's Windows, Mac or Linux. When you start it, you'll get a dialogue like this. I'm already a couple of days into my trial, but it says there's 13 days left uh, <clears throat> on my trial. Uh, so you just need to click on the continue trial button here. Um, and this basically then takes you to the, the project screen in Quercos. And this gives you a list of all of the different uh, projects that you've recently worked on in Quercos. Now you probably won't have any here at first. Uh, so what you want to do is click on the new project button. Uh, the first thing it wants you to put in here is an author name. So this can be initials or your name. Now this is useful if you've got multiple people working on one project. So you can see who did what work. There's also an option here to password protect the files. So if you put in a password here, you must make sure that they are identical. Uh, and then you can password protect your file. If that's useful if you're working with confidential data that you want to securely encrypt. There's also an option here for structured questions. Structured questions are basically when you're asking exactly the same questions in the same order to all of your participants. So that would be in a structured interview, a formal structured interview, or if you're bringing in data from an online survey platform like SurveyMonkey. So I'm going to leave that off for now because we're working with semi-structured data. And then I'm going to click on the new project button. And then what this does is brings up the standard kind of file dialog for your uh, operating system and gives you the chance to choose where you want to save it. So I'm saving it in the documents, but I could put it on the desktop or somewhere else if I was feeling messy. Um, and this basically is going to be the project file that keeps all of your data together. So I'm going to call this um, workshop example. And I'm going to save that onto my documents file. So that's created a new project, which is going to hold all of our sources and all our data. And if you ever wanted to move that file, you can do that. You can also back it up via uh, USB or emailing it to yourself or something like that. So now we've got a project open. We can see with the title at the top of the screen what that is, workshop example. Um, and I'm ready to start working on the project. Now at the moment it's empty you'll see the screen is split in two and we can move it from side to side with this divider here. On the left side of the screen, this is what we call the canvas area. And this holds the codes, the quirks or themes that we want to use to explore and analyze our data. On the right side of the screen, that's where we have our sources of text data that we're going to analyze. At the moment, that's empty. So you'll see along the top, it says click to add source. This button on the very top right here, this shows us the different options for bringing sources of data into your project file. So it copies them in from whatever source you have. The first option you here, have here is to create a blank source. Now a blank source um, is useful if you want to um, amalgamate a couple of sources together. You can copy and paste in here, but also if you want to type, so if you want to have ongoing comments. So I can right click on any text in Quercos and edit it. So it's edit source text here. Um, and I'll type in here and say, this is my research journal and to keep a note of my analysis process here. 
And the advantage of this is that you can code it in exactly the same way that you would with any of the actual sources of data in your project. But later on, you can see results that uh, don't include that data. So uh, just from uh, your actual sources of data rather than uh, showing your uh, research journals as well. Now, the first thing I'm going to do actually here is show you the settings so I can make the text a little bit easier here. It's not very easy for you to see. So I'm going to click on the settings button here. There's an option here for general project preferences. And the first option here lets you make the text a bit bigger. So I'm going to make it quite comically big here just so that you can see what's going on here. <clears throat> so that's the first source we've brought into the project. It's called source one. Um, I'm going to click on this tab here. So there's two tabs for each source. The one on the left is for the text, so the actual data, and the one on the right is for what we call the source properties. So that's uh, any way that we want to characterize and describe the, the different sources of data in our project. But it also allows us to change the title. So I'm going to change the title from source one to uh, research journal. Uh, and then I'm going to create a new property, which is called source type. So these can be absolutely anything. I'm going to call this a uh, journal. It could be reflexive notes or something like that. Okay, so now we know that our research journal is a source type journal. So let's bring in some actual sources of data um, and see how we would work and delimit those. So the other options here to add sources, we have import source select files. So if I click on select file here, can choose um, some files already existing on the computer. So any sort of text files. So these can be uh, Word files, they can be plain text files. Uh, they can also be PDF files. So you can bring in uh, journal articles and literature review if you have those here. Um, you've also got an option here to import source from the clipboard. So if you've copied and pasted something, for example, from a web page, you can create a source directly from that here. There's also an option, import sources from CSV. Now that's the comma separated values file. And that's a common kind of output that you'll get from Excel or also from online survey platforms, as I said, like SurveyMonkey or Qualtrex. So if you wanted to do qualitative analysis of some survey data, that would be the way to bring that in, but also keeping all of your source properties. So if you already had data for things like age and gender and when the interview was conducted, that would allow you to automatically bring that in without typing up that data again. The final option here is select a folder and that will bring in a whole folder of sources at once. So if all of your transcripts that you want in your project are one folder, just choose this option and it will bring in everything in one go. I'm just going to choose the select files here. Um, and then I'm going to go straight to uh, uh, the example project, which you can also download from our website. So in this example folder project here, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five sources here, and I'm going to bring those in by uh, just using the shift key to select multiple ones, but you can bring in them one at a time as well, if you like. So I'll click on open and then it will say five sources have been imported. So those are the five I selected. Click OK. And now you'll see along the top here, we've got these tabs to go through the different sources. And if I click on the text tab here, right, so now I'm seeing Jane's source, Sarah, Mubarak. So these are the different sources that we have in the project. Um, there's actually more than this available. Quercos only shows the three most recently used sources as tabs along the top. So if we click on this button here, that's our source browser. And that shows all of the sources that we have in the project. So you can also see that there is a source for Mabel here, which we don't see, but just clicking on Mabel will allow me to see everything which is down in there. Okay. Uh, this list, you can scroll up and down with the mouse button. You can also search in here as well. So if I was looking for Simon's file, for example, I'll just type starting, start typing Simon, and that pops up here. We can also remove sources from this view with the uh, X button here. Now, this is the only action in Quercos that you can't undo. Removing sources can't be undone once you've done it. So it always asks you if you're sure you want to do that. I'm actually going to say no and keep that source in there. The other thing you'll see listed here, let's remove this here, uh, is the a percentage button. And this percentage indicator shows you how much of this source has been coded. Uh, it's a good kind of way to see which sources you've worked on, which sources might need a little bit more work, um, but don't always feel that you need to get to 100%. You don't have to code everything in your source. Some things are likely to be unimportant.
There's also an option here to change the order. So we can put it in descending alphabetical order by title. Um, we can also put it in order of how much coding we've done, which is none at the moment. Um, so this is the way we manage all the sources in our project. And you can add dozens or hundreds of sources in this way. Okay. Right, so now we've brought in our sources of text. Um, it's time that we describe them a little differently. So if you remember before when we created the research journal, we shifted here to this, the source properties tab that's indicated by this kind of grid here, by toggling backwards and forwards through the tabs for the sources. Um, we've got this example here for source properties. Now the source properties, as I briefly mentioned, are a way that you can describe anything you want to about the sources. So any data that you know that you wouldn't include about the text. So maybe the name of the participant, when you did the interview, what source of uh, <clears throat> data it is, uh, for example, an interview or focus group, or something about the participant, like their age and gender. So for example, in here, we use this little plus button here to quickly add a new property. So a new property, which is age, We'll put in a value for we're a Mabel source here of 22. Okay, so now we've got a new property called age and a value called 22. Uh, we'll create one more property here in the same way and we'll call this location and give Edinburgh as the answer. So you can see in this way that the source properties can be numeric they can be text, they can be discrete, they can even be very long. So you can have something like comments. So it's a great way of categorizing and tagging and commenting uh, on all of the sources in your project. And you can use these flexibly in any way that you could imagine, basically. So one of the other things that we already did here was create this source type variable. Um, the only thing that we have so far with this drop down box here uh, is journal. So this is showing us a list of the source, the different values for this property that we already have in the project. But I can click here on new value and I can say interview. Oops. So that's an interview. We could also have source type, which was a focus group or a survey or something like that. Um, and if we go to one of the other tabs now, so we go to Jane's. We'll see we have all these categories here, all these properties exist, but we don't have values. It says no values associated. Well, with the drop down boxes, we can use any values that we've already entered. So this helps a little with data entry. So Jane's source is also an interview. Uh, she's not 22, she's actually 34. So we can put in a new value for her. She's not based in Edinburgh, she's based in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the comments are, I don't remember this one. And as we'll see in the future, this is a very useful way to uh, kind of cut across our sources, see the results from just one type of participant. So for example, everyone over a certain age or everybody in one location. Um, there's no reason that you have to put in the source properties when you bring in the sources of text at the beginning. You can do it at any time. And so that gives you the flexibility to come up with new characteristics as you think they might be important to the data. Um, there's also a little option here at the top right to show a graph of the properties of all of the sources in the project. And what it's saying actually is most of these are not defined right now. Um, but also we can see that 17% of our sources are located in Edinburgh and 17 are in Washington, DC. As we add more data to the project, this will be uh, a little more useful. Uh, we can go back to this either with a little X here or clicking on the properties button there, and we get back to the source properties. <clears throat> now, when we're done with the source properties, we can just click back here to see the text. So we're now still on Jane's tab here. That's the highlighted one there. Anytime we can switch between the source properties and the text for that source. Okay. So that's how we can categorize and group the sources in our project. Now, the next thing that we probably want to look at is to actually create a coding framework. So we have the sources of data in our project. We've categorized them in some way. Now we actually want to do some coding with them. So uh, this is done with the canvas area on the left side of the screen. And what are called the, the quirks 
what's it called the themes or the nodes or the codes uh, are created with this the big circular plus button here what this does is create a new bubble a random place somewhere on the screen with a random color which is used to hold together all of the uh, text which is about one theme so this example we're talking about uh, healthy eating options for breakfast um, what we're going to do is just have an option here which is for cereal something that people are talking about there's an option here for a longer description if it's not clear what you mean by cereal so stuff you have milk and you can also change the color here so um, you can have any color at all so uh, the 16 million colors available so you can even have different shades and things like that um, cereal I guess should probably actually be some kind of brown shade so we'll keep it like that and then we'll click on the save button here at the bottom left okay so now we can see we've got this little cereal bubble here uh, and I can click and drag and move it anywhere along the screen I like so I can start to put it somewhere that makes sense for me and helps me to group and structure the project and if I want to put some text onto that all I need to do is select text so this first sentence usually I have a pretty big breakfast every day I start with cereal usually moosey okay this is about cereal so I'm going to click and drag the mouse cursor to select that sentence select the text I want and then drag and drop that text onto the bubble and what that's done is added it to the cereal category we've also got a color-coded highlight strip here which shows that this is about cereal so as we go along, it will show us all of the different ways in which we've coded the text data. If you hover the mouse over this highlight strip here, it'll show you a little pop-up showing what that is if you don't remember what the color means. Now you can also right-click on this highlight strip to remove the highlight, and that undoes that coding for that particular sentence and for that particular theme that you added it to. Now I should point out at this point that there is undo and redo buttons at the top of the screen here. So you can undo and redo any of the things that you do in Quirkos with the exception of removing sources. So if you change your mind about something, not a big problem. So that's the first bit of text here. Now what we might do is go to someone else's source and see, okay, the baby has porridge, shreddies, rice krispies. This is also about cereal. I'll drag and drop that onto the cereal bubble as well. Right, so now you can see that the cereal bubble started to get larger. So these bubbles in Quirkos grow bigger as you add more text to them. So the more sources of text you add, the bigger they get. So you're always getting an overview on the canvas of what themes you've coded most and what themes are coming out. And hovering the mouse over it will tell you a bit more information. So in this case, it shows us the description, stuff you have with milk, uh, and also where those codes have come from. So one has come from Mabel, one has come from Jane, and there's only one coded piece of text in each of those sources total. So 100% of the text that we've coded in Mabel and Jane is about serial so far. Okay, so let's change that. <clears throat> now, what we might decide to do here is that this theme about serial is a bit vague. We might want to have something where we tag a little bit more specifically what people are talking about. So I'm going to click on this plus button here once more create another bubble and this one we're going to call Rice Krispies. I'm going to put a description, I'm going to kind of yellow color. Click on save. Okay, so now we have another bubble called Rice Krispies. And this piece of text here, which is about Rice Krispies, I can drag and drop that onto the Rice Krispies bubble like that. And now you'll see that there are two highlight strips here. So it's showing that this piece of text is about cereal and this little bit part of it is also about Rice Krispies. But the other thing I can do is create subcategories, a hierarchy of coding by moving bubbles on top of each other. So if I click and drag and move the Rice Krispies bubble onto the cereal bubble, I've now created a subcategory of cereal called Rice Krispies and this makes logical sense. Rice Krispies is a type of cereal. And I can create as many subcategories of these as I like. So I can also have one here for shreddies. Uh, I'll make that a different color of brown. And I can have another one here for porridge. I'm not sure if that's technically a type of cereal, but there we go. And I can drag and drop these onto the cereal bubble. And now you can see when you put your mouse over the cereal bubble, you'll see the subcategories that you've coded there. They all pop out.
So now I can code this section of text to be about shreddies as well. And this bit of text about porridge. So you just drag onto the parent category and then the subcategories pop out and you drag it, drop it onto the one you want. And now you can see this bit of text is about lots of different things and the color codes show us how we've coded it. So that's the basics of doing the coding and creating the codes and themes in Quercos. Now you don't have to create subcategories like this and you can also change your mind at any time. You can pull out a category, so yeah, porridge, I'm really sure that is cereal, but um, so that's been pulled out there and you can change your mind at any time. You can also create sub subcategories. So I might have, you know, like a kind of own brand subcategory for Rice Krispies. So if people were talking about a particular type of Rice Krispies, we've got a sub subcategory there. That's the maximum level of depth that you can have. Any more than that does start to get a bit confusing. So we don't really support that. We don't really recommend that you go that deep with your subcategories. Um, but remember, there's other ways that you can group and cluster things just by keeping things together. And at any time, you can pull out your codes, pull out your subcategories, pull out your sub-subcategories, or go back the way you like. So Quercos gives you lots of tools like this to manage your codes. Okay. So that's a little bit of coding that we've done in this theme. Now, if we wanted to see the results of our coding, all we need to do is double click on the bubble that we're interested in. So let's double click on the serial bubble. And now we get to see a fully expanded list of the subcategories and the sub subcategories here as well, but also the text that's associated with them. So this has been coded to be about serial. This has been coded to be about lots of things. Uh, so if we want to see just the text for Rice Krispies, we click on that. That's just the text across all of the sources, which is about Rice Krispies. Now at the moment, we've only coded things from one source. If we went back home here, it takes us back to the main view. Whatever situation you get to, if you click on the home button, it'll take you back to this main view. We can go to Jane's source. We can code some more stuff to be about cereal. Put this into the Rice Krispies category. And now if we double click on the cereal bubble, click on Rice Krispies, we can see this text that comes from Jane and also from Mabel here. And if you've coded, so here I've coded the whole sentence, it might not be always clear what the context is. And these little dot, dot, dot buttons here, wherever you see a quote that's come from one of the sources, they can be used to expand the text around it. So I can see more of the source around it and then I can read the context about it. So that's useful if I did something like, uh, if I just coded one single word, now I look at shreddies, I can just see the word eggs. Okay, I shouldn't have done that because I have no idea what I'm really talking about here. But I can load more of the source like this. And then I can even code in this view and make sure that the whole of that, that sentence there is, is coded to be about eggs or shreddies as I've done it in this respect. So this view is also very useful when you're going through later and trying to recode because you can code from this view. Click on the home button here. Now, one of the other things that you might want to do at some stage in the future is merge some of these themes. So for example, we've got this theme here for porridge. Earlier on, I didn't even think that it was a particularly good idea that we had it as a subcategory of cereal, but I might now also decide that I don't actually want it anymore, but I still want to keep the text that I've coded in here. So I've got, yeah, I have a sentence here, which is about porridge. I don't want to lose that. So what I'm going to do is actually merge this into the cereal category don't need the detail of having a separate code for porridge, every instance of porridge, but I can put this into the serial category by right clicking on the bubble. Now this gives me a lot of different views of different things that I can do with each of the different uh, themes, the codes, the quirks on the canvas. Um, and there's this option here, merge. And if I choose me, oh, it's going to choose serial anyway. It says which source do you want to, which quirk do you want to merge this into? And I'm going to merge everything that I've coded into porridge into the cereal bubble, just like that. Okay, great. So now cereal, yep, that's got my sentence there about porridge. So that again helps you in the future to manage all of your codes, especially if you've got lots of them. And don't forget, there's always the undo button and redo button if you change your mind. Let's look at some of those other options of the different things that you can do with the codes by right clicking on them. 
The first option is the overview, and that's what you get when you double click on it. Basically, that gives you the list of all of the different sources, the different uh, quotations that you have from each of the sources. The other thing I have here, I can right click and click on the overlap view. That will show me how often one code interacts with one of the others. It won't show us very much at the moment, we'll come back to that in a minute. There's also the edit view. That basically gives me the same options that I got when I created it. So I can change the title, I can change the description, I can change the color here as well. And that will update across the whole project. There's also the merge view, which we looked at before. Also duplicate view. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, basically change a little bit, so remove some of the things from uh, the porridge theme, basically to split that out. So imagine you wanted porridge and whole wheat porridge. So that way you could duplicate everything that you coded about porridge, uh, and remove everything in one theme that's about uh, whole grain porridge, and that way you'd have two separate themes which are slightly different but based on each other. And the last option here is delete to actually remove one of the themes from the project. Okay. So that's the basics of working with these codes. I'm now going to show you one other way that you can group these themes together. Um, and that's with the groups function. Now, here we've created a hierarchical view like this, uh, where there are sub subcategories. But what if we had things that wanted to belong to more than one category? So for example, if we had something here like juice, and we had something here like orange, that'd better be orange, hadn't it? and uh, apple Is that green okay so with these themes here we might have something we might be talking about let's have subcategories of juice which are orange and apple but this could be a little confusing because actually juice is something that we can eat as well well, juice we can't eat. Juice is something we only drink. We can eat an apple and we can eat an orange. But the groups allow us to create non-hierarchical groups and clusters of themes. So if I click on group, the new and change group, we've got the option here to add a new one. So we'll add one called things to eat. Click on new group. And then another one called things to drink. Okay, so now we've got these two groups which are kind of invisible to us at this stage. But what we can do is right click on any of the bubbles and assign them to one of the groups or more than one of the groups. So for example, if we right click on juice and then choose edit, now you'll see in the groups dialog here, we've got these different options for the groups that we can eat. So first of all, we've got uh, juice is not something we can eat, but it is something to drink. So let's add it to the things to drink group, click save. Now, orange, oranges, now that's something that we can eat. It's also something we can drink as juice. So that can belong to both of those themes. And the same with apple, that belongs to both of those. But cereal, for example, that's not something we can really drink. That's just something we're going to eat. So now, if I click on the groups button, I can actually change the visibility of these. So maybe I just want to see the themes which are drinkable things. Okay, so that's apple. We can drink apple juice, we can drink orange juice, and we can drink juice. Uh, I'll if I turn that off and choose things to eat. Now we don't see juice anymore, but these are things to eat. So apple oranges belong to both of those categories. They're both visible when we turn those on. And if we, we can put on all of the things that belong to any of the groups. So now these are things which are eatable or drinkable. Uh, we'll turn those off to go back to the main theme. Now it's a difficult concept to kind of describe in this way, but it's a very flexible tool for grouping, especially if you go through and doing multiple levels of coding. So what we've got here is a very kind of descriptive coding framework. We're very basically saying people are literally talking about these things, but it may be that we go through and do a higher level of analysis where we're talking about the inferences and the, the what people are meaning by this what the implications are, you know, for something like healthy eating or uh, the wider society or, or some big level concept like that that connects with theory. 
And in that case, we could have two groups of theories, of, of two separate groups here for our codes. So we could have a whole bunch of groups which are um, descriptive, coding. We could have another coding set which is for higher theory. Okay, so again, things like serial, this belongs really to our very kind of low level descriptive coding. But if we started to have themes, we're saying things like um, concepts oops, of self. If we had another one which was um, health and well-being. Okay, so these are much kind of higher level themes. And what we can do is put those into the higher theory category. And some themes might belong to both of these. So concepts of self, uh, that's not going to be in the descriptive coding, but it may very well be the health and well-being is something that people are going to very explicitly talk about as well as something that we're going to infer as a kind of higher level theme. So now we can see just the things which are on our higher theory or just the things which are descriptive coding, That's serial and these things as well. So the groups can be a very flexible way to um, create groups. And this helps a lot when you are managing uh, a lot of codes, when you've got a very large number of codes that you're trying to work through. Because um, you can change the visibility and then you can only see half at any one time. Now let's look at some other ways that we can do some coding. An option here with the magnifying glass, which allows us to do a text search across all of the different sources which are in the project. So I can very quickly put in a word here, uh, like serial. And it's showing me literally every time in all of the sources where the word serial applies. And I can code directly from this, so I can drag and drop that straight onto the serial bubble. And then if I don't see the full sentence, I can choose the little dot, dot, dot buttons to load more of the source. So if you're looking for very literal uh, words, so every time a particular word appears, then you can code in this way. There's also a synonyms database built in here, and that allows you to be a little bit less specific about the different themes that you are working on. So if we turn that on, we'll see that there are other options here. So it doesn't have very many synonyms for cereal. Food grain, grain. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to bring up anything else. Oh, I might have mentioned grain. No, they didn't. Um, but again, that helps you to be a little bit less specific and think about different words. So if you're looking for something like fear or afraid, then it'll make sure that you're picking up some of the other words that people might have used. Make sure you're always getting that relevant context. A bunch of other options in the search category as well. By default, you're searching across all of the sources. But you can also choose just to search the one tab that you have currently open. That's Jane's here. So toggle backwards and forwards through there. There's a history of all the searches that you've run, so you can run those again if you're starting to build something very complex. You also choose whether to search for whole words or sub bits of words, uh, alternate endings like serial, serials, serialing. Uh, you can also choose to refine your search just to the coded text. So this is text I've already coded to something, which is also about serial. But you can also choose to refine it in other words. So remember, we've got those source properties in here now. We can also see results just from people who are 22 years old. Uh, so that's Mabel, right. So those are the times that people, 22 year olds mentioned serial. Um, so again, if we wanted to be more specific about the codes and also just looking up um, inferences of different words, then the search tools help us do that. When we're done with the search, uh, we can just click on the little cross button here, toggle the search panel, close that and then come back to this main view again. Now, there's one other way that I'm going to show you that we can do some uh, analysis of the text as we go and read through it, and that's with the memos feature. Now, you'll see there's a little uh, M cloud bubble here, and that's for the memos panel. And opening that gives us another kind of column along the side here. And what we can do is drag, drag and drop a bit of text in the same way as we put it onto one of the codes, but onto the memo column. And adding to the memo column allows us to write a little kind of 
uh, a little note that's attached to a particular section of text. So in here we can type, this is about a husband. Um, and then, so that's a bit of clarification for us. So we could say, uh, you know, this is very interesting. Time to make their own bread. So you can go through and you can have as many comments as you like. And whenever you hover your mouse over, it will show you exactly which section of text that's associated with. You can edit and change this any time. Um, and this is another way to write kind of reflexive writing, so reflexive text, uh, which is your kind of interpretations and comments. You can also use this for um, uh, using and to, for doing what's called in vivo coding, which is uh, using the participants' own words to categorize what they're saying. So this saying quite hungry. It's a very particular terminology. And then this person here is saying what I really like. So you can go through and you can use Quercos to read and annotate your text. You don't have to do any coding. If that's the analytical style that you want to do, you don't have to use any of these codes. You don't have to assign text to codes. You can just use the memos. And then later on, when you're feeling um, that you've gone through all of it, you can start to put these in themes. So I create one for like here, like bubble. Now, clicking on one of the memo sections will highlight that text. So it's very quick to actually code from the memos. So you can code from the memos onto your other themes. Hungry, we don't have something for that. But what we can do is actually drag and drop text onto this plus button here, and that will add the text to a new theme that we didn't even create yet. So this is hunger. And that piece of text for hunger is already there if we double click on it. So quite a few flexible ways to go through and see your, your data. And now any time that you see um, your text, so if we look at hunger here, you'll see the memos here if you have the memos column open. And you can close it like that. And even when the memos column is closed, you'll still see the little icon. Um, so you know that there's a little memo here and double clicking on it will open and close the panel and let you see what the text is and also hide it if you're not interested in uh, your memos for this particular part of the analysis. So that's the memos, that's the coding, bringing in the sources of text, those are the source properties. Uh, now what we're gonna do at this stage uh, is open a project where we've gone through and done a lot more coding. So that's really the basics of doing most of the operations in Quercos. Now what you want to go through is read sentence by sentence every word they say, code it according to your framework, creating new themes as you go if you're doing a kind of grounded theory approach. Um, but what I want to show you now is some of the tools to help you visualize and explore the data once you've got um, a whole bunch of coding done. Um, so I'm going to open up a file which uses the same sources but I've already gone through and done the coding and creating a coded framework. And I can do that just by clicking on the project button and then open your existing file. And I'm going to open another project. You'll see there is a save but as button here, uh, but there is no save button. Now Quercos is constantly saving as you go through the project. So every time you do an option, every time you add something and do a piece of coding, it clicks save. So if you close the software, if the computer crashes, the power conks out, doesn't matter. It's saved to the last status you have. So it's very difficult to lose your data in Quercos, as long as you're backing up that project file in case something catastrophic happens to your computer. But that also means that you can just open another project anytime, come back to it. There it is, workshop example. Um, but I can click on open other here. If I go to my uh, example project, there we go coded example breakfast. And this example is on our website as well. So you can download this even if you don't have your own data to play with and uh, use it to, to you know, get to use Quercos. So here's Sarah's text. I'm just gonna make the text size a bit bigger because that wasn't an option on this project. Great, so you can see that again. And you can see there's lots of coding that's happened here. Um, 
If we go to Simon Source, yeah, lots of coding here. Again, this is showing us all the different coding we've done. There's a little here, thing here to zoom into the canvas so we can see that a little closer. Um, and we've got some subcategories here, different things people eat for breakfast, different family members here. Um, so that's basically how I've done the coding. Um, there's also a little search bar here. So if you've got lots of um, themes up here, it's like, oh, did I do one for tea? Yeah, there's the tea one. You just start typing here and there's an instant search for themes on the canvas. So that really helps you find when you've got lots of different themes. Right. So now let's look at some of the ways that Quercos helps you once you've coded the data, make sense of your uh, qualitative analysis. So one of the first things that we looked at when we right clicked on themes uh, was this uh, overlap view. I said we come back to look at that. Now what this basically does is show us all the instances like this where one piece of text has been coded to more than one theme. And what might be interesting is to see how many times one theme occurs with another one. So if we right click on the dislike theme, for example, and choose edit, sorry, not edit, the overlap view, we get this kind of Venn diagram where dislike is in the center, that's the theme we chose, and the bubbles which are closest to it are those which overlapped most, so the ones where we coded most often with dislike. So we often said that people dislike their children, uh, they dislike juice and they dislike fruit. And the further out we go from the center, so this is two overlaps, this is one overlap, there's zero. These ones on the outside, there were no overlaps. But we can click on any of these themes. So if we click on dislike and fruit, we can see here are the two instances where someone said they didn't like fruit. So this person says, my partner really doesn't like grapefruit. And that comes from Jane's source here. Um, and then this person here is saying, uh, that they they do eat a lot of fruit, but it's not always the freshest food. So it's something a bit negative there, which we tagged, and that's why that's that's coming as an overlap there. Uh, and if we click on toast, for example, see, yeah, somebody didn't like this particular brand of toast. But you can also code in this view as well, and you can see how it updates. So this is about toast, but it's also about uh, kind of a healthy bread. So we can drag and drop that onto healthy. And now you see that comes closer. It's coming closer to the center as there's more of an overlap. And these highlights here, overlapping highlights, that's what it's kind of counting across all of the different sources. So click on the home button to go back to the main view. And you'll see that this is working for all of the different um, themes that we have here. So let's see what people liked most by clicking on like and then overlap. Okay, healthy eating options. So people liked the healthy options a lot. People like toast, two things for toast two things for fruit. Again, so we can kind of look through the text and maybe we'll be surprised. But now we've got this text, maybe we want to get it out of Quercos and into something else. Well, there's lots of ways that we can do that as well. So one of the things that we can do is copy and paste text that we have here into another software that we're using to write up. And we can do that from anywhere where we see quotes in Quercos. So here we've got, this is everything that pe where people said that they liked fruit. Um, and these little tick boxes here allow us to select those themes, select those quotes, or with this button at the top, we can select all of them or none of them. And then there's a copy button here. So we keep on the copy selected parts, we'll copy those two quotes. And then if I bring, this is uh, LibreOffice or Word or whatever, and you paste in here, that's our text that we've copied and pasted from our source. So there's uh, Sarah's quote, there's Jane's quote. So now we can copy and paste everything where people said something positive about fruit. So you can see this is a really quick way to get your um, data out of Quercos into the section that you're writing about. And also just to tag different bits of text that were interesting. So it's really interesting to see these are all the positive things that people said about fruit. So anywhere where you see quotes in Quercos, you'll be able to, to, you'll see this little tick box here and you can select and copy the, the quotes. So that's a really useful tool. I'm gonna to click on the home button again. Uh, and now what I'm gonna do is uh, run a query. So if you remember previously, we created some source properties. And this example project, we have gender, we have age again, we've got uh, city, kind of like location again. 
but we can use these properties to filter our results and just see results from particular sources or particular groups of sources. So that's done with the query view. So if I click on the query button here, the query view lets us basically run um, a search for matching quotes, um, anything which we have in the project database. So the properties is one of those things, the source properties is one of the things, but we can also look for work done by particular people or work we did on a particular day, so maybe at the start or end of your project. You can search for results by group or source title if you wanted to see results just from one particular person even, or a couple of people. But I'm gonna keep property here. Uh, I'm gonna change this from gender to city. We've got city equals Belfast. And then there's an update button here, and if we click that, there we go, that updates that, the results. And now we can see these are the results of, well, it looks like it's just Simon that lives in Belfast, but it's everybody that lives in Belfast. Uh, it's sorted in descending order, so diet was the thing that people in Belfast were talking about most. So maybe that's interesting in itself. Well, we can select all of those quotes, we can copy them, and then we can paste them as everything that people in Belfast said about diet. But we can also split the screen in half and do a comparison. So if I click on the compare button here, this splits the screen in two. So we've got one quote query being run on the left here. That's our city equals Belfast. But we can put another one in here. So let's do city equals, what else do we have in here? Edinburgh, great. We'll click on update. And now side by side, we can see the differences between the projects. So Jane, so Jane lives in Edinburgh. Does anyone else live in Edinburgh? Yeah, Sarah. So Sarah and Jane both live in Edinburgh. We can click on these bubbles to see how much the people from Edinburgh are talking about particular things. What's interesting straight away is in Edinburgh, people eat a lot more toast than they do in Belfast, according to this. Or at least we've coded more sections of text from our Belfast participants than we have, for, sorry, from our Edinburgh participants than we have from our Belfast participants. Again, maybe this is something that's interesting. So Quirkos is always trying you not to rely on the numbers, but getting you to read back and read the qualitative text and see if this is a worthy trend or whether it's just some kind of coincidence in the way that we've been coding. Now we can also add, make these um, queries more and more complicated as well. So for example, here we've got people who lived in Edinburgh. We can add an extra row to the query and we can see maybe we just want people in Edinburgh who were you know, over or under the age of 22. We update that, do we have anyone there? No, okay. So maybe that way. Yeah, I think it's the same people. But the idea is that you can add more and more people, um, more and more categories to your searches. And if you want to see people who are just the men from Edinburgh who are over 22, then you can do that and you can also use this side by side comparison to compare your different groups of people together and the update button here will give you um, will rerun the query so to update whatever you've changed here uh, the single button will toggle back to the single view you can make the different um, columns different widths here you can hide the panel if you like if you want to see it in a kind of more full screen mode um, so lots of different ways that you can kind of play with the data here. So now we'll go back to the main view, zoom in, and we'll look at some of the ways that we can export the data um, and do reports from our data. So we click on the export button. There's a whole bunch of options here. Let's look at the first one, which is to create a report. Now the report's a pretty boring, pretty comprehensive standard thing, which basically gives us all the information that we have about everything that's in the project, basically. Um, so you'll see here that the screen is split in half. And on the left side of the screen, we've got a preview of what the report will look like. And on the right, the options of different headings that we can have. So there's a sources summary here, which tells us all the different sources that we brought into the project. We don't need to see that, we can untick that section. Uh, you can also scroll down and you can see there's graphs here of our source properties. There's the views. Now any of the images in the report, you can drag or right click and save the image if you want to put it into a PowerPoint or into your uh, report that you're writing up. So any of the visualizations you can have in that way. And there's also a bunch of ways that you can customize the visualizations as well. Keep scrolling down, you'll see the properties here. 
So um, here's the actual text. There we go. So that's everything people said about healthy, everything people said about cereal and like and dislike. Um, and you can also include the properties in here. So here, so there, now I've got for every quote, who said it, how old they were, where they lived, their gender. We can also change change it so it's text by source rather than text by theme. So that's everything that, yeah, that's everything Mubarak said and everything Simon said. So there's a whole bunch of different options here. And when you've got the report showing the information you want and formatted in the way you want, you can either print it out directly, you can open it in a web browser to play with it a bit more, you can save it as a Word file, you can save it as a web page, or you can save it as a PDF file. So let's quickly create a PDF of our report. Uh, workshop export. Um, we'll open that file. Right, and now we've got a PDF, PDF file we can share with someone which has got all the uh, data formatted in just the way we wanted it. Great. So that's one of the export options. The other one here is the word cloud. You've probably seen these before. They're a kind of fun way to visualize uh, the language that people use. Basically, this is a frequency analysis of all the different words in the project um, and shows us what the most common words are. So we zoom out a little bit. So it's so like it's toast usually. Um, and you can format, maybe you want it in a star pattern or something else. You can have a threshold here so that the less commonly word used don't appear. There's also a stop list included. So this has a stop list of the 150 most commonly used words in spoken English. Um, but you can also add extra ones here. So so we don't really need to see that, so we can remove that here. Um, so then you can get a sense of what people are talking about. There's also a list here of a literal kind of count of all the different words, and I is the one that appears most often, 55 occurrences. And then finally, there's the option up here, you can choose which sources. So if you want to see just what one person was saying, compare that to someone else, then you can do that just by choosing which sources to count in the export. And again, you can save this as a web page, or you can save it as, a, as an image, which you can embed in a PowerPoint presentation, a poster, or whatever you're doing. So that's kind of fun. There's also the option here to do a spreadsheet export, a CSV export. Um, so what that does is create, um, we can create a folder to create all those, to save all those files. It basically creates um, spreadsheet files, which let you um, <clears throat> bring your coded data into another piece of software, especially something where you want to do some quantitative analysis like SPSS or R or even Excel. So I can open, for example, quotes. Uh, I think it's going to open in, in OpenOffice here. Yeah, so now we've got a kind of standard spreadsheet here with all the data that's coded in the project. So here's a quote. Breakfast, we only have toast or cereal. It comes from Sarah's sauce, toast. I coded it and such and such a time. And then you can use any of the tools here. So you can sort things alphabetically. Um, you can do, um, you can use the pivot tables and the content analysis. Um, you can do a lot more statistical methods, integrated reliability and things like that if you've got multiple coders. So um, it basically gives you a lot of different ways that you can play with the data outside of Quercos. So that's pretty useful if you're looking for something a little bit more quant. There's also um, the ability to export all of your um, imported code, uh, coded transcripts with your coding as a standard Word file. So you can create either a one Word document for each of the sources you imported, so basically getting them back out again, or you can create one long Word document with all your transcripts in it. And the neat thing about this is that you can share it with someone who just has Word or LibreOffice or Google Docs, anything that will open a standard Word file. Um, and that will basically give you a, uh, show you as, as a kind of, with the color coded highlights, just as if you, you'd done this on paper with highlighters or if you, you coded it in Word using the, the comments theme here. So again, this is really nice to print out, especially if you've got a color printer, read it away from the software, 
But the other thing that you can do with this is, is share it with your supervisor or someone else that um, you want to show kind of how, how you're going and you're thinking at this time. And they can not only see the transcript, but exactly how you've been coding it, even without using any special software. So that's a pretty unique thing. There's also the option here to export as QDPX files. And this is the, the REFI QDA standard. And this is basically by the end of the year will be supported by all qualitative software packages. And it means that you can import and export your coded data from any software package to another. So if you've done some work in uh, MVivo and you want to bring it into Quercos or vice versa, you can do that with the QDPX project file. Uh, you can also save just the sources from your project or just the structure, just the coding framework without the sources. And this option, what that does is let you uh, reuse the a structure. So if you had a standard coding framework, so for example, a standard evaluation template that you wanted to use on another project, you can delete all of your coding and delete all of the sources and save just the, just the coding framework to use again. And vice versa, if you use export just the sources of the project, that will show you just the um, sources, removing the coding framework, and then maybe you have someone else uh, redo the coding in a different way, or if you just want to start from scratch and try a completely new coding framework again, but don't want to have to put in all the sources and source properties again. So that's a whole bunch of different ways that you can get the data out of Quercos when you've done the coding. Now there's just one final thing which I'm going to show you here, um, and that's basically how you can use Quercos to kind of uh, look at your coding framework in a slightly different way. So we've got this ability here to move the bubbles around. Um, you may probably get to the stage where you've got quite a lot of themes, especially if you've got a lot of clustered themes, and it's going to be a bit difficult to see what's going on there. Well, with the view button here, you've got a whole bunch of different options about how you can display the codes, the quirks in Quercos. One of the options here is tree view, and that basically creates a list, and it's a lot more like how you'd see it in um, NVivo or uh, Atlas TI or some of the older qualitative software. Um, so if you're more familiar working like that, it works in exactly the same way. You can still right click to see all the same options. You can still drag and drop text onto these, um, but it's especially helpful if you've got lots of things coded because you can just keep, uh, sorry, lots of subcategories or lots of codes because you've got a big list of them basically. And you can turn that off and on here. There's also excuse, the option to put things in uh, a grid arrangement. So you can put them by alphabetical order. You can put them in descending order of size or ascending order of size. And there's also an option here to show the number of codes. So by default, Quercos tries to not make you focus too much on the number of different codes that you assign to each of your themes. Um, it just shows you the relative size but you can turn on with this view option, the number of codes, and then you can see exactly how that is. And all of these options of rearranging the canvas and showing your data are available in the report as well. So however you want to kind of uh, capture your, your coding framework and share with others, you can do it in a very visual and creative way with Quercos. So that's all the basics of working with data in Quercos. <clears throat> I should also mention here in the project files, the save as option. Now, if you wanted to, uh, you know, create a separate file so that um, you've got a kind of snapshot of your work at a particular time, use the save as button for that. There's also the option here for merging projects. Now, this is particularly useful if you're working with a group of people and you've been coding separately. You can bring all of your data together in one project. Or maybe if you've got two different things you want to bring together, so you did all the interviews for, you did all your interviews in one file, and then you started all your coding of your focus groups in another, we can bring them all together in one project. And that creates a new project when you merge them together. So it doesn't actually mean that you lose any of the data with of how of your separate projects. You'll keep your separate project files. And that's the same if you're working other people. You also get to keep the files of how you're working individually, but you can also create a file at any time where you can see all the work which different people did. Okay, so that's a, uh, all that we're gonna go over today. Um, Again, there's a lot more information on our website if you wanted to see some of the different um, ways to use Quercos. There's a lot more guides and tutorials on there, uh, more video guides, including um, some kind of 10 minute overviews, much more detailed ones here. Um, there's also full manuals as well. So we've got um, manuals and materials here. So there's a complete manual here. There's a getting started guide. 
um, which kind of gives you step by step going into the project for the first time. Um, you can print these out. We can also send you printed copies of them as well. Um, and we'd also recommend that you just play with it. So give Quirkus a try, play and explore the software um, and see how you get on with it. And if you've got any questions at all, you can also get in touch with us uh, via our website or by emailing us. Um, so uh, don't get stuck. Get in touch with us. We're always here to give you as much help and advice as you need. So thanks very much and hope you enjoy using Quirkos.